the topic of discussion today is going to be is software quality an oxymoron? One of the first questions we need to ask ourselves is what is software quality? How do we define software quality? Um, there are many definitions that people use to define software quality. One of the things that I always like, it's very simple, uh, to the point, that is conformance to requirements. Um, if a software that was written uh, or an application that was built, it conforms to requirements, then <clears throat> we can safely say that it follows uh, the quality standards that we had set for ourselves. Um, now, what do we mean by requirements? So requirements basically means what is it that we want the software to do? And uh, it could be a series of tasks, it could be certain objectives that we want to accomplish. Um, and in addition to that, uh, there may be also some other constraints that we may want to put on the software. For example, we may say that we would want the software to accomplish a series of tasks that results in some end goal. But we would probably impose a restriction saying that those steps, those tasks, and the end goal must be achieved within a certain time frame. So now we have a performance requirement. Um, on top of that, we may also say that, look, we may want multiple people, it could be tens of people, hundreds, hundreds of thousands of people, be able to use the same software at the same time and be able to achieve those goals, be able to complete those tasks in a reasonable period of time. So these are all the performance requirements. Now, when we state these requirements, they have to be very clear, they have to be well-defined, and they cannot be ambiguous. Um, now, software, when we build software, we write software applications, uh, we create software systems. But, as we all know, software doesn't exist by itself. It needs a hardware infrastructure for it to run. So when we talk about requirements for a software application, we also talk about hardware and infrastructure requirements. And if there are other requirements like installation uh, instructions, uh, periodic fine-tuning of the application, or any administrative tasks that, as users, we need to perform on the application, on the software, then they become the operational instructions. So in total, uh, these form the specifications or the requirements for a software application. Now, do we all agree that it makes sense that that would be kind of the totality of requirements that we want to specify at a high level? <coughs> okay, good. Um, so, <clears throat> increasingly what we're finding is that there is probably another way to define software quality as well. Uh, traditionally, uh, people were of the mindset that when you built a software application, when you built a website, it either worked or it didn't. Um, and um, many of you, if you've been watching the, uh, the news shows, uh, there are a lot of people on, who have uh, been on these uh, cable networks uh, who have complained that the White House has put out a statement saying that the website is now 90% operational because I've heard people say, well, that is a lie because 
websites either work or they don't. And software works or it doesn't. Um, well, uh, there is a, probably a group of people who look at it like that. But now when we look at this other definition of software quality, what it says, and this is being, this is approved by ANSI and IEEE, is the degree to which a software application meets customer expectations. So now once you insert the word degree, it means that there are several levels that we can look at when we talk about compliance with quality. So we can say that a website or an application is 90% compliant, so it works 90% of the time. Um, certain users who may be trying certain uh, functions or certain features may find that it doesn't work. But for most of the time, we can say that based on our testing, the website works 80% of the time or 90% of the time. Uh, now, <clears throat> we're doing all of this, why? Because we want the customer to accomplish his or her objective using the software quickly and easily. Even with the, uh, uh, the Obamacare website, um, uh, the uh, healthcare.gov, uh, we wanted people to go to the website and to be able to do certain things, to accomplish certain objectives. And we want to be able to define these interactions in a way that comes naturally to humans. Uh, we want it to be intuitive. Uh, we do not want to learn something that is counterintuitive to our normal behavior um, because anytime you try to change behavior that's always a challenge and also we need to be careful that when we uh, build these so software systems that negative consequences are minimized because you may build a system that does the job very well but some of the outputs or some of the outcomes of this software application may cause negative effects on other people who have to use or who are on the periphery of this software application. So, um, so this definition of software quality gives us a little leeway in terms of how we define whether a software application or a website meets quality standards. It's not zero or one. It's not black or white. Uh, we can, using uh, several methods of testing, very clearly be able to say that 80% um, of the time the website will meet your goals, will meet your objectives. So uh, let's dive right into the healthcare.gov website. Um, this website was launched uh, couple of months ago, uh, I guess um, October 1, um, uh, there was a, a lot of expectations. People had a lot of expectations. So now, can any of you say why this website was launched in the first place? Anybody? Okay, so it had to be launched on October 1 because I'm not sure if it was a self-imposed deadline or it was something that Congress mandated that it had to be online. Okay, so that's one of the reasons the uh, website was launched on October 1. But why the website itself? I mean, you know, we've been able to administer a lot of the other programs over the years um, using um, um, other tools, um, faxes, telephones, and other things. So why did we um, decide to make this website the primary focus? There was a lot of hype about how this website was going to do everything for everybody. Um, 
Yes. It's supposed to make it, I think, the process of getting health care easier and or more accessible to the public. Right. So you, you hit it up right on the head. So Dave's question was, uh, Dave's answer was that uh, one of the reasons why we wanted to launch this website was to make the user experience, to go look for uh, the various options, uh, be able to select an insurance plan that best meets your needs and then be able to buy it if you want it. So that's the reason for uh, the uh, uh, the healthcare.web website. So, so the goal was really to allow consumers to shop for health insurance, compare plans, and then buy the one that best suits their needs. Now, did that happen? Well, not right away. Well, um, no, it, no, it didn't happen. Uh, now, what really happened was many customers were unable to buy health insurance. Some of them got through. Um, again, uh, it was a very small percentage of people who probably got through in the first few days and were able to really complete the transaction from start to finish. But the majority of people were not able to achieve their goals. Uh, so were the customers satisfied? Obviously not. Now, how many of you, uh, the people here are from a software background or have knowledge about building websites, uh, software applications? Oh, okay, so I see one, two, three, four, about five hands go up. Okay, uh, so when the website failed and there was all this uh, bad publicity saying that, um, you know, how could a country like the United States with all its uh, technical prowess uh, couldn't even get the website <coughs> right? Uh, how many of you were surprised that it didn't work? I was surprised. Okay. Um, well, to tell you the truth, I was not surprised. And, and here's the reason, because the undertaking was so complex and the time allocated to complete the entire project was really not realistic. So I was not surprised at all that it didn't work. I probably was surprised that it didn't work to the extent that it did not, but uh, to tell you the truth, I was not surprised. Yes. Can I just ask a question? Um, what was the budget for healthcare.gov? Uh, it was um, over $400 million. So basically, unlimited budget. Well, okay, so we'll get to that. The unlimited budget is a huge problem. Um, so, so was it a surprise? Um, for, most, for most people, um, I, uh, to me, it was not a surprise because even running up to the launch of the website, uh, what the White House did was they had engaged a group of consultants from McKinsey and asked them to play the role of the red team. So they went in and they said, we're going to test the functional requirements. So we're going to do a black box testing. So we're going to make sure that every single function that the website is supposed to do works, right? Now, in order to do that, uh, I know there are some QA people here. So in order to do a functional black box testing, what, what would you want? I mean, if someone came to me and said, well, hey, I just built this wonderful system, uh, but I'm not sure if it does all what it's supposed to do, uh, I would want you to do some tests and tell me where I stand. And I'm going to say, well, I'll first start with the functional testing, the black box testing. Uh, what, uh, what would I need? Requirements. There you go. I mean, you know, if I do not know what the website or the application is supposed to do, how am I supposed to do any black box testing? So when McKinsey looked at the uh, website, <laughs> one of the first things they said 
the infrastructure, well, they had a, a, a long report, but I, I'm just kind of uh, extracting some uh, you know, high-level points. Uh, they said infrastructure and business rules for consumers, employers, and suppliers were not adequately defined. So if the business rules were not adequately defined, then how can you really do an end-to-end -end functional testing and say that it works? Because there are holes in the business rules. Uh, there are rules that haven't been defined. There are functions that haven't been specified. Uh, the acceptance criteria for a lot of these features were not defined completely. Um, so <clears throat> um, I think uh, the statement that uh, the McKinsey Group made I think is very valid. They said, look, uh, a lot of the rules have not been adequately defined, so if you expect us to do an end-to-end -end functional testing, uh, that's not something that we can do uh, very well. We may be able to do some of it, but not all. The other thing they said, yes, please. Did they fail the, the test then? Well, well, what they said was uh, um, there were some very serious flaws uh, more than 40% of the back-end functionality hadn't even been built. Um, and, um, and the code was in very bad shape. So uh, those were some of the observations that uh, McKinsey included in uh, their report. How long into the project did McKinsey get involved? Good question. So, McKinsey was brought in three months before October 1, uh, when I guess someone got a little bit anxious, nervous that uh, nothing was going uh, according to plan or the test results were not coming out uh, the way they had expected. So they decided that it was best that they bring in an outside firm, an impartial firm, who could come in and then make the recommendations. And one of the recommendations was that, look, don't go live, you know, delay the day, delay the day. Um, but we all know, um, you know, those things don't happen in Washington, even in our companies a lot of times, uh, you know, when management says it will go out on this date, <laughs> you, you, you know, it goes out. So, um, uh, and, and the second thing that they really uh, brought out was, Implementing these health insurance marketplaces, I mean, you know, every state may have one. There's a lot of these insurance companies that are in the mix. Now, integrating all of this presented some unique challenges that uh, many of these uh, software engineers, the technologists, have not had experience before. Uh, this was something that was unique. This is the first time that many of them are looking at these different pieces because uh, you know you have uh, the Social Security Administration, you have Medicare, Medicaid, you have IRS, you have uh, all these different agencies. But now you need to look at all of these things and see how they can communicate with each other because they all need to fit into the uh, the, the puzzle, if you will. So one of the recommendations that McKinsey said was, uh, you know. These are challenges that are very unique. No one has attempted to do this before, which makes it a very high risk proposition because the risk, when you try to quantify it and see how you can mitigate it or how you can avoid it, I think it's, it's gonna be a great challenge. So the two key things, the two takeaways from this uh, report, would be one, requirements were not adequately, adequately defined and it was overly complex. So for many of us, it was not a surprise. Uh, and uh, the fact that there's been a tremendous improvement since October to December um, says a lot about what has been done. Uh, so, yes. One of the questions, sir. Who was the lead contractor on this and how was it selected? From yes, yes. Um, so it was a Canadian firm um, that had 
<laughs> I, know where uh, I know why you're laughing. I mean, I had the same uh, reaction. Uh, I mean, you can't, can we? I mean, some of the best are probably here, you know, right in this room or in the United States. You know, why go elsewhere? Uh, so, uh, but. Um, they had experience growing up in Canada. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, so, um, so one of the, the things that McKinsey said again and again was the level of complexity was too high. And they then went on to list some of the reasons why uh, the complexity was too high. There were too many interactions between the IRS system, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and the insurance marketplaces. Because before uh, the website can tell you what kind of insurance uh, plans are available to you, it has to do a whole series of checks. So it has to check with Social Security on what your status is. It has to check with IRS on what your immigration status is. Um, and it has to check with Medicare, Medicaid as to what kind of uh, 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 programs or, um, or, or facilities that you're making use of now. So, so there's all these interactions that need to happen. And, 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 and what makes it even more complex is a lot of these systems are legacy systems, mm -hmm. uh, which have been just wrapped with uh, newer user interfaces. Uh, that may simplify things a little bit. Nevertheless, we're still dealing with COBOL code and a lot of antiquated systems. Mm. Uh, you know, maybe I, I'm sitting uh, in a field with my head in the ground, but I don't recall this being advertised. You know, what you, I don't know, you read this report or you read a summary. I never saw it. So having not seen this, that's why I was surprised when October 1st came. In other words, I didn't, I didn't see any foreshadowing. Well, <coughs> a good point. Um, and, 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 and uh, you know, no one wants to be the bearer of bad news. So when these reports came out, there were people still telling um, the powers that be, oh, we're going to get it fixed. Oh, you know, it's going to work. I mean, and this happens every day in our companies as well. I mean, we deal with it. Um, we know that, um, you know, there's probably not enough time to get things right. But when the big boss comes in and says, well, it shall be delivered tomorrow. It shall go into production next week. You know, we all say, yes, yes. Well, you know, we're going to work through the weekend. Oh, we're going to get this thing done. Uh, so that probably could have happened as well. So even though they saw the report, the reports that were going up said, oh, no, we're, going to, we're working on it. We're going to get it fixed. But did this go out to the press that this was uh, a debacle about to happen? Well, it did not go out to the press until the debacle. Ah, there you go. Right. So as soon as, uh, very soon after the debacle, after October 1, uh, the report was made public. Okay. Being um, distracted by a government shutdown. That was the other yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, there we go. I, I mean, that may be a reason, right? Because when this was launched, we were in the middle of a government shutdown. Yes, Phil. When did they discover that it was uh, that the requirements for medical clearance? It was uh, three months prior to uh, the launch date. So uh, it was. Uh, they got involved. They're the ones that Yes. That? Yes. And was there any explanation of why the original contractor didn't realize that the requirements? Well, so so the reason uh, was that a, a lot of the backend stuff, which is where all the interaction happen, happens between the different systems, wasn't even started. So they hadn't even gotten to that point yet. Um, and I'm not sure what the thinking was, and uh, this is my guess, a lot of times you know, when you have the uh, the top layers, the user interface and, and part of the middle tier um, all uh, functioning, you can get all the input and store it in the database. So as the backend starts, uh, you know, getting into shape and becoming operational, the data is there. So then you can feed it into the backend and then, you know, you can send the uh, the results back to the user. You know, that may be one of their thinkings, but I don't know. I mean, that's that's just my guess. So, uh, McKinsey found that almost 40% of the website, uh, not the website, the back end, so uh, specifically the, the data layer and the databases 
uh, were not even um, um, in their inception phase. I mean, it was just uh, very much uh, not done. Um, now, uh, the other thing that they said was when data was being transferred between these different agencies. So, for example, when you go in, put in your name, a social security number, birth, your birthday. Uh, it is sent to the IRS for verification. It is sent to the Social Security for verification. So now the data is going back and forth. And every point of transfer, every uh, interface point where there are systems, two systems communicating, that is a point of failure. That is a point where there could be serious security exposures. And that is something that they pointed out as well. So. Um, <coughs> When people sign in, um, they may not complete the application, but then um, say what they put in. And that's not data that is fully secure. Um, and also, the other thing that was not mentioned is um, it, it, there were uh, a lot of reports in the press. Website doesn't work. Pick up the phone. But again, that was misleading information. What happens when someone picks up the phone? It goes into a call center the person answering the telephone has a terminal, has a computer, and guess what he or she is doing? I mean, trying to enter the data into the same kind of system. So that doesn't work either. So very soon it became apparent that um, calling a, a telephone support number is not going to help things all that much. Um, now, the other thing that the web, uh, that um, the, uh, the administration didn't do right. They wanted everything done and they wanted all of the functions in uh, uh, and, and really rolled out in all the 50 states. Right? That was a huge, huge challenge. I mean, when you talk about doing that kind of a deployment, uh, so many things can go wrong. And even just the delivery planning and the planning that needs to happen to turn over those systems into production and make them go live is I, 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 it's just mind-boggling. So that was something that um, uh, they tried to do. Uh, yes, Dave. Well, it seems to me that, they, that a lot of the, the issues came or, or were either directly or indirectly the result of tremendous public relations pressure. Can't come out and say, "Well, we're just going to roll out a little bit of this in uh, in a little town in Iowa, uh, and, and for just for some people, just to see how it works on a small level, and then grow it, because that would be attacked in the press, or it would be a, a political issue." Uh, and so there was all this pressure to do the whole thing right now, immediately on this date. Absolutely, I mean, you hit it right on the head, and and because of political pressure, and this happens on a smaller scale, even in. Uh, our places of employment. Um, you know, there are certain things that have to be done even though we know that uh, it's not the wise thing to do because of uh, politics and political pressure and that's really what happened here as well. Uh, so, so there was no phased rollout. Uh, you know, typically what you want to do is create a minimum marketable product. What, what's the minimum set of functions, features that the customer really needs to get started. So as a user, as someone shopping for insurance, what are some of the basic things you need to get started? And if we had kind of defined that and then, uh, you know, developed a roadmap where the first version had a smaller subset of functions, the absolute uh, minimum set of functions and then incrementally we added functions and then at the end we had the whole website operational that would have been a better approach uh, and the last but not least which is uh, something that we all need to be uh, I think we all have uh, run into the situation when you're working on a project and all of a sudden you know you hear uh, at the water cooler through the grapevine that oh, you know, funding for your project is going to be cut. You know, funding, you know, it's not very certain. Um, you know, that's, that it doesn't do anything good for your morale, right? <laughs> so uh, I, there were at times, because of, again, politics, uh, funding for this project was uh, 
it was not sure how much uh, was going to uh, be approved, when, how the money was going to be released, and all of that. But at the end, I mean, uh, really the cost was, uh, the project was uh, greater than $400 million. So now, uh, uh, how many of you have heard of the uh, Standards Consulting Group out of Boston? You know, they do a lot of research and analysis into technology projects in the United States, Canada, and Europe. Uh, so, according to their definition, any project that is greater than $10 million is considered large. Um, so, when you look at small and large projects, okay, so their definition is, you know, if, you're, if your project is less than a million dollars, it's classified as a small project. When uh, it goes greater than 10 million, it's, it's large. But now just look at the percentages of successful projects, failed, and challenged projects. So you look at a small project, uh, the, the percentage of successful <coughs> projects is almost eight times the uh, success rate of a large project. So you got 10% of large projects successful, whereas when you look at small projects, it's uh, almost eight times that, 76%. Uh, failed projects, 38% uh, when you talk about projects over 10 million. Um, and four projects, uh, four uh, percent, less than a million. Now, we're talking about challenge projects. Challenge projects are projects that do get completed, but in many cases it's uh, delayed over time. I mean, it goes over budget. And, and also, sometimes uh, by the time the project is completed and delivered, the customer no longer wants the project. <laughs> or doesn't want to use the project. That's the worst. Yeah, right? <laughs> so, so those are challenge projects. So there again, you see a big difference. When the project is small, uh, again, your uh, probability of success really goes up. So this is all good and dandy, but is this the real world? I mean, you know, we're all talking about projects that run into the millions and millions of dollars, right? Um, so uh, it is okay for a consulting group, for a, a think tank to come up and say, well, hey, we did all our studies and this is what it is. But then how do we tackle this in the real world? Um, Think big, act small, right? I mean, uh, we have to deal with big projects. I mean, that's the reality. You can't get away from it. But let's see if we can think big, but then act small. Uh, you know, the triple constraints of cost, time, and scope, we all know when, it, when the project gets too big, I mean, it's impossible to manage. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it, it's, you know, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's just crazy. So break down large projects into small ones such that each one is a minimum marketable problem. Now, that's easier said than done because to go to management and to sell this idea is not easy. But, you know, we'll, we'll go through a, in subsequent slides how we can kind of do that. Uh, but if we can look at the entire picture and see how we can break it down into smaller projects and then have these smaller projects be worked on by completely separate teams, then probably we can increase the probability of success. Now, one of the things that management immediately um, asks you to do, even if they buy into this thing of breaking it into smaller projects is, hey, why don't we do a you know a parallel stack the project? So hire uh, 200 people. You know we can do all these projects at the same time, so we can get this, get this thing done. Um, you know in stuff in two years, you can get it done in three months because we're doing all these small projects at the same time. Uh, we got all the resources. Uh, it doesn't work. Why? Because it is not easy to identify all the interdependencies all the uh, 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 interrelationships between all these things that easily. So the rule of thumb is, 
you may want to pick up three or four projects. I mean, you know, once you've broken them down into uh, a series of smaller projects, have a roadmap uh, based on uh, the priority of the business because everything is driven by uh, the business needs. Technology is just an enabler to help businesses succeed. So prioritize these projects based on the business needs and pick a few, you know, three, four. Uh, you know, those are things that are easily manageable. The other thing that also um, as, uh, that studies have shown is using cross-functional teams uh, with uh, the number of members in any team being, say, between eight and ten, really brings out the best, and they turn out to be the most productive. Um, and software has different layers. You have the presentation layer, you may have uh, you know, the web services layer, you may have the middle tier, you may have the data layer, uh, and that's called a software stack. Now, if you have a team of members that are skilled in all the different layers, that would be the best situation to have because anyone can jump in um, and do any of the tasks um, if someone is out sick or if uh, if there is a, an emergency but in reality that doesn't happen so what typically happens is we have uh, special uh, people with certain specializations but through training and mentoring the goal is to really uh, get into a cross-functional kind of situation where everybody is quite familiar with the entire software stack um, any questions? Any comments? So it's, it's a cross-functional team made up of different software professionals. So. Yes. Yes. So so you may have a a person who is uh, really a, a database uh, analyst, um, or someone who is really strong in the middle layer, uh, or someone who uh, is very good at the presentation layer. Uh, so the team really has all the skill sets that it needs to function as a unit. And in doing so, um, they're really able to produce uh, a lot more and quickly than traditional teams uh, that don't have such a setup. So, you know, let's talk about what really are the success factors for these projects. Uh, so I took the top 10, right? So we have uh, uh, executive management support. I mean, that is really uh, the most important. So, you know, these are all different weights. Uh, so they add up to 100. Uh, so that has a weight of 20, 20% 20, uh, 20 or 20. Uh, user involvement is 15. Uh, optimization is 15, uh, skill resources 13, project management 12, methodology 10, and then you have 6, 5, 3, 1, um, the, the bottom four. Now, one of the things that really jumps out at you at this is if you look at the top five success factors, that's almost 75% of the, uh, uh, the success factors required for a project to succeed. That is, that's, to me, is amazing. I mean, so, if, uh, so what it really means is, I mean, you focus on the first, uh, uh, you know, five or six different success criteria, success factors, you can boost the probability of your uh, success in your software projects uh, uh, tremendously. So let's, uh, you know, look at each one of them. Um, at this point, any questions? User is customer. Um, yes. End user. Well, end you. Well, user. I'm using it as a generic term, so it could be the user, anybody who is affected by the software. So you may be an actual operator of the system or you may be someone on the periphery 
where the output of this system now affects you. Um, or you could be the person who is paying for the system. So when I say user, uh, I'm, I'm really um, talking about everybody who is affected by the system in one way or the other. Stakeholder. Stakeholder. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, yes. So, so that's what it is. Um, Okay, so uh, management support. Uh, now, one of the, the, the things that make this so important, uh, this has uh, the, uh, uh, the most weight, if you will. It, it, it's got 20%. Uh, now, we want to come up with a very simple vision. Now, why is it that we can and will be able to come up with a simple vision in this case, whereas with a very complex project, we may not be able to. Because here, we've already broken up the huge complex project into sub-projects. So for the sub-project, articulating the vision and clearly telling the stakeholders, telling the engineers what we're trying to do becomes an easier process commitment from management. Now let's assume you have a, a 500 million project, a, a lot of stakeholders, a lot of management involved. I mean, there is no way you're going to be able to get on their calendar, make them attend meetings. There is no way you're going to be able to get them involved in some critical decisions. Uh, you may send them an email, you may go talk to them, it's probably sitting on their desk. They got a million other things to worry about. So to get their commitment when you're working on a huge project is very difficult. But now, when you're working on a smaller project, a project that where the scope is much smaller, their investment in terms of time, effort, also becomes smaller. So the probability of you getting onto their calendar, the probability of you getting them to uh, join a conference call or to attend a meeting um, goes up. <coughs> so you're able to get a stronger commitment from executive management by kind of reducing the scope of the project. Now, high, high velocity. Again, you know, a smaller project means that you can get things done. You're, you're selecting a smaller subset of features, uh, which means that uh, you can get those things implemented quickly and uh, be able to demonstrate that to management. Uh, that is key. Uh, traditionally, uh, we use uh, performance dashboards, uh, reports, status reports, and, and, and there's a lot of do documents and artifacts that are used to report to management on the progress of a project. But now, with uh, newer agile methodologies, uh, we want the management to be present at our feature presentations. So we do a feature presentation, for example, every two weeks or every three weeks. What that means is, hey, you need to be present because that sh tells the team, that tells the engineers that as a top manager, I'm interested in the success of this project. I want to come and see how you guys are doing. So that really um, increases the, the, the morale. It, it's a morale booster for the team. So when you see the top management at, at these uh, feature presentations every two or three weeks, they get excited. So uh, the, uh, the velocity with which you're able to show how things are progressing, not just reporting, they may still want to have the traditional dashboards, and uh, we still have to provide that. But in addition to that, these feature presentations really help. Now, the, the roadmap is important because, yes, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, is it possible that in, in the case of healthcare.gov, uh, that there was sort of uh, the strength and the dysfunction of executive management support? It was very strong support. In fact, it was demanded that executive management demanded that this be released on such and such a date, but their involvement was dysfunctional. They could not be really deeply connected to all of the inner workings and development, 
yet the demand was there, and that, that's partly what sank this. I, I, I agree. I, I totally agree. And uh, they were also probably not shown exactly how things were progressing. They were probably given reports, um, so no one had a real idea of how the website was really functioning until it went live. So, uh, yes, uh, yeah, good point. Uh, now, the roadmap is important because when you break things up, management still wants to be assured that at the end of it all, you're still going to get the entire thing done. So you want to be able to present the roadmap and be able to uh, convince them that you're on the right path. Now, the kill switch is important. Uh, and the kill switch becomes easier to define uh, when it's a smaller project. Uh, because uh, when you go off track, uh, you can uh, determine the variance and, and see how far off you're off, uh, you're off the uh, planned uh, um, track. Or uh, based on, since we're doing these demonstrations every few weeks, uh, the response feedback that you're getting also tells you if you're on the right track. So, uh, so it's very easy to make a determination. Now, is it something where corrective action can be taken? Can we do a course correction? Or uh, have we really kind of missed the mark where we need to uh, flip on the kill switch? So that's something that uh, we need to be able to articulate to uh, a management as well. So uh, we're not spending more and more money trying to um, cover up past mistakes as opposed to just making a clean cut and then say, let's move forward. Uh, which is what I heard they did with a lot of the pieces in the healthcare.gov website. A lot of the pieces were uh, rewritten or uh, built from scratch. Even though the entire website, the overall architecture still stayed the same. Uh, uh, user and mouth, uh, and this is very, very important. So the first step is identification. Who are your users? Uh, the stakeholders, um, people who uh, are going to pay for the project, um, people uh, who are going to be affected by it, um, uh, management, um, and the actual people who are going to be using the software. Uh, any other department, any other group that is going to be affected by this. Um, and also the people who are going to be operating and running the software. Uh, because now, you know, one of the new trends is that uh, when we architect the system, uh, you know, we use the term, uh, you know, DevOps. It's not just development alone. We want to have operations at the table as well. Because now when we're architecting the system, uh, we don't want to just develop a system and then um, turn it over to production and say, hey, operations guys, now it's your problem. No, we want their input right when we're designing the uh, system. So DevOps, the combination sitting at the table right from the start uh, is something that is becoming increasingly common, and uh, which is a good thing. Um, so identifying all the stakeholders, all the users, everybody who's going to be affected uh, is key. Uh, did you have a question, James? Yes, I did. Uh, for healthcare.gov, did they identify the user? Because I don't know about people in this room, but I, I didn't need health insurance, but I went on there and I started poking around just to see. So you have this, health, this website that's available to everybody in the United States, maybe even outside of the United States. And there's no restriction for you to get in there and, and do anything. So do you think they did the identification? Well, so that's a very good question. So. A lot of these things are not being made available to the, to the public. You know, as we all know, when we start defining requirements, we also define personas. Who are the different types of people who are going to be using the system? So for each persona, we try to define what the steps are. How would they interact with the system? So. I haven't seen any reports which says when we decide to build the healthcare.gov website, these are all the different personas that we consider. So you have a very good question because that is key. I mean, we really need to identify who the different users are. Uh, you know, it could be students, uh, 
who are healthy, who really don't need uh, coverage, uh, we probably want them. So we need to have a strategy on how uh, we make them sign up. Uh, we probably need individuals who have uh, preconditions. So we need to be able to identify all these different personas and, and then <coughs> come up with a set of requirements on how we address the needs of each of these personas. Uh, and I'm not sure if it was done. I'm pretty sure someone did it, but uh, it hasn't been made public. Um, any other questions? Okay. Uh, so communication. Uh, you know, now that we've identified the stakeholders, the different personas, the users, and uh, everybody else, uh, communication is key. Uh, because we all need to understand what the expectations are. The business side, they are looking at it from what it's going to mean to their bottom line, uh, how are they going to make money, uh, uh, the user, um, the consumer is going to be looking at it from a different angle. So we want to make sure that there is adequate communication so that we get all the requirements. And the bigger the project, the more complex it gets, and the chances of failure go up. And that's why, again, break it up into smaller pieces because then uh, your probability of success your probability of making sure that you get all the required um, um, feature set um, it goes up. So, so smaller is always better. Um, and then you've got to use the latest communication tools because uh, we're living in a world where uh, teams are um, remote, they're dispersed, they're in um, uh, different locations, they're in different countries. So it is incumbent that we use proper tools to communicate. Um, I still see, um, you know, a lot of companies use just conference calls, and that's fine. But why? I mean, you know, we have video conferencing at, at almost nothing. I mean, you know, you can use um, uh, Google Hangouts. Why? Because seeing the person, uh, I mean, uh, looking at their body language um, it, it makes a huge difference. I mean, you know, and especially in certain cultures, uh, you know, they'll say yes to everything. Um, but, um, you know, you want to see how they're reacting and you need to say their body language. So you've got to use, uh, you know, the latest communication tools. Um, and uh, when you use these tools, uh, it's a lot easier to get feedback, it's a lot easier to get inputs, uh, communication, and uh, collaboration becomes, uh, import, uh, it, it becomes easier. Um, when it comes to communication, the, some people forget that, you know, if you're running a project, you're communicating and you're doing your job, but it's important that you get that communication back because especially when you're talking about transcultural sorts of things. And what your words mean may not be the same thing as what they're hearing. So you have to have them communicate back to you so that you understand that they understood you. Absolutely. Um, and, and, and um, you know, there are several courses that teach um, how this cross-cultural uh, communication works with different countries. Uh, absolutely, because that is uh, one of the uh, causes for misunderstanding. Because you walk away from the conference call, from the meeting, thinking that it's going to be done in two days, but that's not what their uh, understanding was, and then uh, there is misexpectation. So, um, yeah, that yeah that is important. Uh, we're we're going to get to that uh, in a later slide. Okay. Uh, and consensus building. Uh, you know, it, it especially in technology, uh, the command and control approach doesn't work anymore. We're, we're looking for innovation. We're, we're looking for collaboration. Uh, really, you know, the project manager or the boss saying, well, you shall do this, you will do this, and the, the, this is the way you do that, generally doesn't work. You know, you want to be able to build consensus among the team, make sure that everybody is heard, uh, and you really want to make sure that anything that is decided upon uh, that every team member has a buy-in and feels comfortable about that. Now, how do you 
get all of these things done. We talked about communication, feedback, cross-cultural differences. Uh, uh, one of the best ways to do that is before you get started on a project, drop a working agreement. Um, you know, uh, I do that in my projects all the time. Uh, with the team, we draw up a working agreement saying, well, you know, these are the things we will do. Uh, for example, uh, you know, every, uh, for, uh, as an example, if we're doing Scrum, you know, every day in the morning for 15 minutes, we're going to have a stand-up meeting and everybody will attend. Um, um, the way we're going to communicate and resolve issues, this is the way we're going to do it. Um, feature presentations, uh, you know, these are the people who would be responsible and this is how we do it. So there is a working agreement that we draw and this is something that the team does and everybody signs and says, well, this is the way we're going to work as a team. So that's something that, uh, you know, helps us a lot because what we do is we um, drop the working agreement, uh, have everybody sign it, really blow it up and put it on the wall. So it's up there for everybody to see. So, you know, every, every day you come in the morning, it's up there. Um, so optimization, uh, you know, we talked about it, we touched upon this a little bit. Uh, try to reduce the scope, that was the whole point of kind of breaking projects up into smaller sizes. Team size, uh, eight to 10, you know, I found it to be the most optimal. I wanna hear from folks uh, who, who, who are in software or in other uh, areas as well. I mean, what is your typical team size? Six, and as little as six, and then as much as ten as well. Okay. And it's about that that size, and it works nicely. Right. Uh, yeah, I would think so because you know I've seen um, traditional legacy projects where we have team members 25, 30. Uh, you know that becomes a challenge because uh, it becomes very hard to manage, um, and also quality suffers. Um, um, estimates um, again when the project size is small we're able to define the work packages better, uh, which means we're able to come up with time estimates, cost, cost estimates better. And the same applies for uh, quantifying and identifying risk. When you have smaller work packages, um, when you have uh, uh, the scope is contained, uh, it is a lot easier to uh, identify what the risks are and also come up with a risk mitigation plan. Uh, we talked about continuous delivery. So every so often, uh, show something to the management. Um, and if they refuse to come to your presentation, that is an indication that your project is not that important to them. And, 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 and you need to make it a point and make it known that uh, you know it is really affecting the morale of the team. Um, so. If they can, and we uh, time box our presentations, uh, half an hour. So first 15 to 20 minutes uh, presentation, and the rest is Q&A, uh, questions and answers. So if the executive sponsor does not show up, I mean, that is a bad thing, because that means uh, he or she doesn't care or doesn't feel that it is important enough for her to attend our presentation where the team has worked so diligently to make sure that all these features have been worked on and presented. So, continuous delivery. And uh, we talked about priority, prioritizing the different features. Because uh, we always need to be concerned about yield, return on investment. What does it mean to the business? Uh, is it going to uh, bring business value? Um, how is it going to um, be looked upon by the customer? Is it important to the customer? Is the customer willing to pay for it? So return on investment, yield, uh, that is something that uh, you always need to look at. So optimization uh, is something that uh, gets 15%. Uh, Skilled resources. Uh, this is really, really uh, important in my opinion. Uh, you know, I would give it more than 30, 13%. Uh, because it's all about the team. Uh, if you have a mature 
skilled team, you know, wonderful things can happen. Um, so the competency of the team um, really needs to be um, on par. Uh, it needs to uh, meet the needs of the project, the team chemistry. Um, and this is where uh, leadership comes into play. And, and, and you were uh, um, talking about how to make sure that you elicit opinions and uh, get feedback from everybody from different countries, different cultures. Um, so uh, as leader, you are really playing uh, the role of a servant leader or a facilitator. And one of the things that uh, we practice is never be prescriptive. Do not prescribe a solution. As a leader, as, you know, we're all here, experienced professionals. We've been there, done that. We know the answer. Uh, we can tell you exactly what to do and, and, and be done with it. But to motivate the team, do not get prescriptive. Ask the questions because you know what the answers ought to be or you know what the right answers need to be based on your vast experience. But ask the questions because the team loves when you ask them, um, okay, so have you thought of this? Have you thought of that? So by asking the questions, you are actually eliciting the answers that you want uh, from the team itself. And in some cases, you may be surprised. They may come up with something totally different which is much better than what you had in mind. So it is a learning process both ways. Um, so uh, one of the working agreements, uh, uh, when I talk, talked about the working agreement, one of the things we put down is the project manager should not be prescriptive. So that goes in right there. Um, so uh, the, uh, 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 the team, the chemistry, uh, training and education so that everybody's cross-functional is important. Um, we uh, define um, in, our, in our project area, you know, it's set up like this. Uh, we call it the safe zone. Uh, so when team members come into this safe zone, everybody's at the same level. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter uh, what your title is. You can be uh, the CEO, you can be the uh, senior vice president, doesn't matter. Uh, you're all at the same level. Everybody's allowed to say what they feel. Uh, it cannot be personal. Um, it has to be um, something that is constructive, related to the project. It can be a uh, critique or it can be something that you want to bring up as an issue, um, but that's fine. But this is a safe zone where no one is penalized for speaking up. Um, and one of the good things about a small project uh, with a uh, not so long um, lifetime means that the turnover is going to be less. If you have a project that's probably three or five years uh, in length, the likelihood of people going in, people being pulled out for other projects, uh, new people coming in, is going to be greater. But if you have a small project, let's say, and you time boxed it to six months, then the probability that uh, people are going to leave, there, there still maybe people who leave, but your turnover is going to be less. Um, and uh, toxicity is not allowed. So if any person, uh, because of personal reasons, personal issues, creates a toxic environment, you try to address it, but it has to be immediately taken care of and removed. Uh, mm -hmm. Mentoring, it goes without saying. Uh, we talked about cross-functional uh, uh, team, getting everybody up to speed on all the different layers in the stack. Uh, any questions? Uh, so uh, product management expertise is uh, something that I think, uh, you know, is, is, is important. Uh, we talked uh, a lot about this, um, uh, about, you know, uh, being a leader, a servant leader. Uh, and bonding means not just bonding with your engineering team. A lot of the times the project managers or people managing, running the project, uh, they're very, very close with the engineers because their background was probably, um, a, 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 you know, engineering as well. But you really need to make sure that you have a strong bond on both sides, um, the business uh, and marketing, sales, as well as on the engineering side. So as a leader, uh, 
it is incumbent upon you to make sure that uh, you're communicating, you're uh, really bonding with everyone and not just your team. Uh, and it is not us versus them. A lot of times the engineering team feels that it's us versus the management or the business. Uh, and as a leader, it's up to you to make sure that that is not the case. And you've got to make sure that the team believes that. Um, business understanding, ownership, uh, being non-prescriptive, uh, we talked about all of that. Um, so, so now these are the five things we talked about and we really covered 75% of the factors that contribute to success. I mean, we should be done. I mean, we should be happy with this. I mean, you know, if you look at the reports um, right now, about 7 to 10% of major projects succeed. So if we can go from 7 to 10 to about 75% uh, by adopting some of these principles, I mean, I think we should be really happy. But now, here comes uh, uh, a piece of good news, a real bonus. Now, if we are able to implement at least some of the things we talked about, and not get it up to 75%, but at least get it up to 50, 60%, whatever it is, there are some bonus that you get at no cost. And when I first read uh, about uh, the studies that were done on that, I did not believe that it was true because over the years uh, I've moved more onto uh, agile methodologies than the traditional waterfall. So when I saw this, it really blew my mind. Uh, so if we adopted the above approach, our success rate would go up 75% from the current 10%. Um, so, um, and this is in line with what we started with. So remember we said that if we work with smaller projects, we'd probably be looking at about 70, 75, 76% uh, success rate. So the study that was done separately um, kind of matches with what we've been talking about. So I just wanted to bring this slide back to show you that uh, we're, we're probably um, on track, or at least you know there is a, a coincidence, or no, not a coincidence, that there is a correlation of, uh, that between the two studies. Um, okay, so. After those five top guys that took up about 75% of the success factors, we have process methodology. And this is something that we're going to get, this 10%. We can boost this uh, success rate to 85% without doing a thing. And, 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 and this is something that, you know, really, uh, you know, I was excited about. So here's what it is. It doesn't matter whether you use Agile or Waterfall. You know, if you got those five things right, if you did all those other five things really well, um, you know, whether it is Agile or whether it is Waterfall, your success rates are going to be pretty much in the same ballpark. Uh, I did not really expect it. I thought Agile was going to win really big time. Uh, but this is something that uh, most people, especially uh, the newer generation who are really gung-ho about Agile, uh, uh, would not want to believe or they probably don't even know this. In summary, uh, executive support is very important. Uh, you know, try to break down the project, uh, try to define what your minimum marketable product is. Uh, we all know, I mean, this is being repeated so often and, um, and, 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 and you read this all the time. Only 20% of a product's features really get used. 80% of it uh, doesn't get used much. Um, a large project is 10 times more likely to fail than its smaller counterpart. And 
we all know, stakeholders want it all, they want it now. So <laughs> breaking up a larger project and getting them to focus on the critical 20% is not easy, but we got to keep trying. Um, um, and, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, you know, we have to uh, keep at it, uh, try to convince them uh, incremental delivery is the way to go, uh, phase approach is the only viable solution for um, a software that meets quality standards and software that works. Um, so uh, thank you all so much for your time. <laughs>